All right, it's 11 a.m., so let's get started. Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar um, with the Illinois EPA Office of Energy's Public Water Infrastructure Energy Efficiency Program. Today we're gonna to be talking about oxygen transfer efficiency, diffusers and aerators for activated sludge plants. So today's webinar will focus on a variety of different aeration technologies and their efficiency at transferring oxygen to the fluid medium. So we'll talk about different sorts of technologies. We'll talk about that oxygen transfer itself. And then we'll talk about how energy efficiency plays a role in oxygen transfer. Um, we'll also touch on the placement spacing of aeration equipment and, and how that impacts oxygen transfer efficiency. So we really look forward to today's event. We have two awesome presenters from CDAC joining us today. Um, and we thank them for um, pulling this content together for everybody. Um, just wanted to let you know, if you have questions, uh, please pop them in the Q&A box or the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout um, today's session. And good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining and saying hello in the chat. Please feel free to continue doing that. Um, but we will answer questions at the end of the webinar, but please feel free to enter them throughout the session and we'll address them at the end of our presentation. Um, this session will be recorded today and sent to everybody afterwards. Um, and of course, the all important CEUs, we are offering CEUs for this one hour webinar. Um, and I will put the course number in the chat. I will also send it in an email to everybody afterwards. But you're, if you're interested in a participation certificate, please feel free to pop your interest in the chat. Or um, you can also email me at cassie at cdac.org. Again, I will put that all in the chat, but CEUs are available for today's presentation. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us. If you have questions, again, put them in the chat, but I look forward to today's presentation. I hope you do too. And I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Hannah Ahn to kick us off for today's event. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Cassie. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Hannah Ahn. I'm an energy engineer here at CDAC. And joining me on today's presentation is my colleague, Ryan Siegel. He is one of our senior energy engineers and we'll be doing a handoff about halfway through. So you'll be hearing from him later on as well. Okay. So um, we are the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center at the University of Illinois. That's a lot of words, so we go by CDAC for short. We work with customers from all sectors to help uh, identify energy savings opportunities at their facilities. Our goal is to reduce the energy footprint of Illinois and beyond, which is why we're focusing on energy efficiency at wastewater and water treatment plants. A little bit about the IEPA Public Water Infrastructure Energy Assessment Program. We work with the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center to provide energy assessments for both wastewater and water treatment plants across the state. As part of this program, these energy assessments are completely free and available at no cost to uh, municipalities. I know that a lot of our attendees today have rece already received an energy assessment from us in the past, and we've really enjoyed meeting with all of you and working with you and um, learning more about your plants. In each assessment report, you can find a comprehensive list of cost of upgrades, energy savings measures, estimated payback periods, as well as any applicable incentives or funding opportunities. Um, these may be available through your local utilities or state organizations. We've heard from customers that our reports have helped them secure funding for upgrades by presenting the report findings to their board or municipality leaders and getting budgets approved. In addition to energy assessments, we also offer technical assistance. So maybe you've already received an assessment for your plan and you're looking at a particular measure to implement and weighing different options. We're more than happy to take a deeper dive and explore those options with you. Uh, through this program, we also offer continuing education events for operators as we're doing today. 
Um, if you're interested in applying for an assessment today or checking out our upcoming events, you can head over to our website at cdac.org slash water. So why might you want to get an energy assessment? If you have an older plant or have never had an assessment done before, we're able to identify missed opportunities, plan for capital improvements, uncover ways to improve the process with low or no cost measures. If you have any concerns about maybe meeting effluent targets, we can certainly analyze ways to adjust the pro process so you're not always worried about going over. Our reports also offer third party support for your own ideas for plant upgrades and improvements. So as I mentioned before, we've seen our reports used to help communicate suggested upgrades to board or municipality leaders. Our reports are produced so that people with non or less technical backgrounds can really understand each measure, the cost and return on savings involved. Now, if you have a newer or recently upgraded plant, you might be wondering if it's necessary, but I can tell you that we have looked at plants that fall in this category, newly built plants, and there's always something we find and more to improve. It can also help you plan for future opportunities and explore new technologies. It's also a great way to benchmark your plant and make sure that it's operating as intended. So it's a very simple process to apply for an energy assessment. First, you would complete an initial application on our website. Again, there's our link, cdac.org water, where you can find the application uh, along with our past presentations, case studies, and more. To qualify, your plant has to be located in the state of Illinois and be a publicly owned plant. You also need to allow us to visit the site. We can complete the site visit either remotely or in person. This is completely up to you. We're more than happy to serve you regardless of which option you choose. Some operators prefer to do a Zoom call while others prefer to, for us to come out on site. To complete the site visit, we will need facility and utility information from you. Finally, we'll need to make sure you're comfortable with us sharing the final report with Illinois EPA Office of Energy. Once we've received your application and you've indicated that you're comfortable with all of the points listed above, we'd work with you and your team on collecting data. This includes facility information such as uh, discharge reports and process flow diagrams. We ask for at least two years of utility bills and DMRs. This allows us to benchmark your building and identify any trends or anomalies in your energy usage and flows before we conduct the site visits so we can go in with an understanding of your plant. Then it's time to set up the site visit. We'll typically have one or two members of our team go out to the site and complete the site visit. What most people don't get to see is that once our team members go out on site, we all regroup as a team and look at each plant together to learn about the process and explore the savings opportunities for each plant. Now we're going to do a quick review of the key points from our previous presentation on uh, introduction to aeration and energy. So if you attended the previous presentation, this will be a nice refresher since it's been a few weeks. If you didn't attend the previous presentation and you're interested in learning more, those, presenta those presentations were recorded and they are available on our website. So we have carbon and ammonia entering our wastewater from human activities, and this produces biological oxygen demand, or BOD. Microbes need oxygen to break down contamination. Wastewater systems provide the oxygen to supply the required BOD. The BOD test is conducted over five days to model natural uptake of BOD in streams. Our goal is to get rid of the BOD so that it doesn't end up in our 
natural waterways so that it doesn't deplete the oxygen and possibly kill organisms. From the illustration on the left, you can see that when the DO level is 6 MGL, we have a nice happy fish. But when the DO level goes down to 1 MGL, well, the fish isn't so happy anymore. We can take our concentration of BOD and apply the amount of flow to convert that into a number of pounds of material to estimate how much oxygen is needed to meet that demand. One of the factors of BOD is dissolved oxygen or DO. DO is measured in milligrams of free oxygen molecules per liter of water. It's a concentration in a moment of time, which is important to keep in mind because it doesn't predict what the future will look like. Oxygen transfer rate is the rate at which a system is dissolving oxygen into water. This is how much oxygen your blowers or aerators are putting into the system. The goal is to balance the oxygen transfer rate with the BOD. When we accomplish that, we maintain a steady DO concentration and avoid swings in oxygen levels. If we have a scenario with a low oxygen transfer rate and a high BOD, then the DO concentration will naturally decrease. This will cause poor water quality, inadequate treatment, and potentially kill the aquatic life downstream. On the other hand, if we have the opposite scenario with a high oxygen transfer rate and a low BOD, then you end up with a high DO. While you don't have any dead fish in this scenario, you end up introducing more DO than needed, which means you're wasting energy. Um, of course, when you're wasting energy, that means you're also spending more money on utilities and emitting more greenhouse gas emissions into the environment. Oops. So now that we've looked at a scenario with a high DO concentration and another with a low DO concentration, we understand why balancing BOD with oxygen transfer rate is important to understanding aeration and energy and how it's critical to minimizing facility costs while treating water effectively. So now we're going to take a closer look at the different oxygen transfer terms and factors. So here we have three key oxygen transfer terms. We have our standard oxygen transfer rate, which we just discussed. And we also have standard oxygen transfer efficiency, which is the measurement of how much oxygen is transferred by a given aerator in clean water. This oxygen transfer efficiency is used to calculate how much air is required to provide necessary oxygen needed for treatment. A higher efficiency indicates less air required. And theoretically, all oxygen supplied will be transferred, but this is unlikely. The oxygen transfer efficiency can be calculated by taking the oxygen transfer rate and dividing it by the oxygen supply rate. We also have our standard aeration efficiency. The aeration efficiency can be calculated by taking the oxygen transfer rate and dividing it by the, bl the blower power input. SAE is used to compare the energy efficiency of different aerators, and this allows you to analyze the operating costs of different aeration technologies. In order to increase our aeration efficiency, we want to reduce the blower power input, which can be done through blower selection and blower speed management. These efficiencies are impacted by bubble size, contact time, and mixing. There are th many correction factors when it comes to aeration, and we're gonna focus on three of those correction factors today. So first we have um, an alpha factor. So the alpha factor is also known as the contaminant factor. 
It's the ratio of process to clean water mass transfer. It accounts for contaminants in the wastewater and is impacted by soaps and detergents. The significance of the alpha factor is largely dependent on the contaminants present in the wastewater. In fine bubble aeration tanks, the alpha values can vary from 0.4 to 0.7, while in coarse bubble aeration tanks, the alpha value can range from 0.6 to 0.95. Beta is also known as the saturation factor. It's used to correct for the dissolved solids in wastewater. The solubility of oxygen in wastewater is about 95 to 99% of that of pure water. So as a result, beta is typically understood to be in the range of 0.95 to 0.99, uh, unless dissolved oxygens are extremely high. And then we have our theta factor. Um, theta is the correction factor for the temperature of the wastewater. Um, and it's commonly understood to be fixed at 1.024. So now we have a poll question. So which of these factors is most difficult to ac accurately determine? Our alpha factor, beta factor, or theta factor? Seeing a lot of results coming in. I'll give everyone a few more seconds. All right, so we have um, a nice mix and the correct answer is the alpha factor. So this is because the alpha factor is dependent on soaps and detergents and it's really hard to, um, it's really hard to test for those and it ends up being the most variable factor. So here we have an equation for actual oxygen requirements. So you can see we've highlighted our alpha, beta, and theta factors. So you can see how each of these correction factors plays a role in determining the amount of required oxygen. These correction factors are not only critical components in designing systems to meet the design oxygen requirements, but they are also important factors to consider during operation and upgrades. Another correction factor to consider is fouling. So in the top image, you have nice diffusers in good condition, while in the bottom image, you have diffusers with signs of fouling. So foul diffusers lead to increased pressure drops, also known as dynamic wet pressure. This is likely to lead to cause this is likely to cause an increase in energy consumption in order to overcome that higher pressure drop. Foul diffusers also cause oxygen transfer rate of diffusers to decrease. This may cause issues with maintaining rated plant capacity. So on one hand, we've seen that most plants are designed with higher capacity than needed to accommodate for future growth. However, we've also observed that many of these growth projections haven't quite panned out. And in some communities, the population's actually declining. So this leaves us with plants that are way oversized for their needs. Even if the fouling 
isn't bad enough to impair the transfer, cleaning diffusers peri periodically can help reduce energy consumption. And now we also we have another poll question. I am pulling it up now. Okay, so which of the following is a possible result of foul diffusers? Got a lot of results coming in. So I'll give a few more seconds. Which, so the poll question is, which of the following is a possible result of foul diffusers? And the options are larger pressure drops, decreased oxygen transfer rate, centrifugal blowers may surge, or all of the above. And I'll end our poll. And so the correct answer is all of the above. So we talked about the higher pressure drops and decreased oxygen transfer rate. But when you have higher pressure drops, you also risk the pressure increasing beyond the safe range, which may cause centrifugal blowers to surge. So all of the points listed here are possible outcomes from foul diffusers. All right. So aeration process factors. There are many factors that impact the aeration process and the microbes ability to absorb and process oxygen. One of the primary factors is temperature. Cooler air contains more air per unit volume, which can allow plants to turn back aeration equipment further in the winter. Microbe activity also tends to decrease with temperature, which reduces the immediate need for air. And as blower demand is reduced, retention times may need to be extended in winter to achieve the same level of treatment as in summer conditions. Oops. Let's find that slide. Here we go. Time is another key factor. The longer liquid is retained for processing, the less processing is required per unit of time. And this is closely related to oxygen concentration and mixing. Decreasing time concentration or mixing requires one or both of the other factors to increase for the same treatment. Decreased activity of microbes uh, reduces the immediate need of air. Aeration technology and diffuser placement also have a substantial impact on oxygen transfer. And Ryan will be talking more about these two factors later on in today's presentation. So depending on the type of equipment at your plant, you may want to consider cycling your basins between oxic and anoxic. We've seen multiple plants with oversized equipment that aren't able to turn down and they end up operating closer to uh, four to six MGL instead of maintaining the DO target around two to three MGL. Cycling can help reduce energy costs by allowing the BOD to absorb the additional oxygen, bringing the DO level down, and then cycling the aeration to recharge the basin with oxygen. Typically, we've seen these operate periodically for about one hour on and three hours off, which will give you six cycles per day. Now I'm going to pass it off to Ryan to talk about aeration technologies. Thank you, Hannah. 
Some of this may be a, a little bit of a review again for those of you who did make last month's uh, presentation. Uh, some of the uh, looking at the, the blower efficiency, this is normally where uh, people start uh, considering where they uh, are. And uh, it may be common for people to look at this and you say, well, why wouldn't I necessarily uh, just use a, a turbo blower as we see here? Uh, that we've got uh, turbo blowers are, are generally more uh, a higher efficiency unit uh, as compared to uh, lobe or, or screw blowers. Uh, and so uh, two things that, that we do need to be considerate of is a lot of times these efficiencies are uh, based on a single point or, or the best operating point uh, for the particular blower and, and not, partic uh, not a particular range. Uh, and they also don't give any real indication as far as what the range is, and this may depend on the, the blower manufacturer uh, and the, the specific blower uh, selected. So uh, as we kind of touched on uh, last time with Sean and Jane, uh, over aeration can also reduce uh, transfer efficiency. And so being able to provide the right amount of air uh, without excess is very important, uh, not only for uh, energy efficiency, but also to uh, provide uh, good transfer and, and good uh, biological health. And so uh, understanding that there is a very big difference between uh, what's available as far as turndown uh, of the different blowers on the, in the market. And uh, as Hannah also mentioned, these are, are commonly selected based on your worst uh, case scenario. Uh, typically, this is going to be a warm summer day with a, a high load uh, loading profile, uh, which may never occur as either the uh, growth doesn't occur as predicted or uh, the influent may not be as concentrated as, as projected. And so, uh, Understanding these factors, this is where uh, having that ability to adjust your aeration level uh, really comes into play uh, and where the rubber meets the road. Uh, while multi-stage and turbo blowers are more efficient commonly, uh, their efficiency does uh, and, and will normally decrease with speed. Uh, and as Hannah mentioned, their minimum speed is typically limited uh, due to the falling pressure. And so, uh, plants may consider either installing uh, multiple blowers uh, for staging uh, and may even add a positive displacement blower uh, for times where you, you have low loading on the plant uh, to supplement the uh, centrifugal uh, style of blowers. Uh, and also Hannah mentioned as far as uh, perhaps using cycling for those plants that may uh, have oversized equipment. Uh, however, uh, turbo blowers uh, may not take too well to that depending on their, their style. So, uh, you know, turbo blowers are, are definitely one that likes to stay running uh, once they're on. So, uh, understanding that uh, the blower speed is commonly being set uh, or is limited by the, the depth of the uh, aerator sets uh, and positive displacement uh, can produce the uh, same pressure regardless of their speed. Uh, whereas uh, pressure output for centrifugals uh, decreases with the square of the, the speed. And so that's where it's very important to uh, consider the, the blower range versus your load range uh, when sizing. So if you have a very uh, wide load ranging, then you may need to, uh, you may want to select uh, blowers that may have either a larger operating range uh, or uh, perhaps multiple size blowers. So when you are under high loading, you can operate your larger uh, blowers, and when you're under low loading, you can switch to smaller ones. So. Several different considerations uh, when we're going through, you know, considering that 
this aeration is a system. Uh, so we have to produce our air, then we have to deliver the air, uh, and then we have to distribute the air. Uh, so here, illustrating that uh, through our, our pictures, you know, typically we will generate it with blowers, uh, then distribute it through pipes, either above grade or below grade, uh, and then uh, distribute it uh, commonly for most activated sludge systems, uh, distributing it uh, at the bottom of the basin. So uh, air generation is common. Uh, what we see when uh, for facilities is the, the various blowers. And normally this is where what people are thinking of when they think of uh, energy efficiency, uh, which makes sense because this is where all the electrical power uh, is actually going to. Uh, and so uh, as we've move away from the, the blowers themselves, understanding that's that's been a, a big focus uh, previously, uh, looking at the air delivery mechanism. Uh, and so, you know, understanding this includes everything from the, the piping and all the individual valves, uh, is understanding that the more piping there is, the more potential there may be for leaks. Uh, underground piping is particularly uh, notable because they may leak, uh, they may often leak without being obvious until the leaks get to a point at which uh, you, you may end up seeing uh, the ground looking as though it's carbonated when it rains. Uh, as the, the, looking at the, the lower picture, uh, we see <laughs> this was uh, one facility that did have some substantial leaks in their underground piping. Uh, and so uh, there's definitely a, uh, a trade-off between above ground and below ground piping. Uh, above ground piping may be easier to maintain. Uh, however, it may require a little more uh, care and, and maintenance uh, because it of the exposure to uh, ultraviolet as well as uh, potential for physical damage to it. Uh, however, uh, while underground piping uh, has previously been uh, the more common piping scheme, uh, systems have understood that uh, it doesn't come without risk, uh, particularly with degradation and uh, galvanic reactions. Uh, underground piping can be uh, very susceptible to uh, damage, even if it's not just a uh, physical strike that it's a, a being a, subjected to. So, something else that we don't commonly talk about uh, is understanding piping length and velocity. Uh, the lower the velocity that you can uh, push through a pipe, that generally gives you lower pressure drop, uh, which increases and improves that room for turndown, uh, as, as Hannah and I have, have both mentioned. Uh, because the uh, speed and energy is related by a cube, even a, a little bit more turndown can make a dramatic change in energy consumption. Uh, and so making sure to consider, can I uh, improve the piping system to lower velocities uh, to get that pressure drop uh, to decrease. So uh, also understanding that T's and bends can add substantially uh, to equivalent length, uh, increasing that pressure drop. Uh, and so here we see uh, at one particular facility, uh, as the uh, as the piping runs underground, uh, it's nearly 300 feet of underground piping. And so uh, this doesn't account for any additional uh, equivalent piping length uh, for bends and T's uh, and the like. And you know, taking this a little bit uh, more to an extreme as far as uh, avoiding T's and, and minimizing bends, uh, this picture on the right has, is a system that's kind of taken that to the extreme, uh, trying to uh, really avoid making 90 degree bends uh, and so introducing uh, air and fluids uh, at uh, the, the closest to straight angles as, as possible. Uh, so here's a, an example of what that might look like in, in practice. And Again, noting here, trying to minimize uh, elbows and, and avoid making uh, sharp turns. Uh, 
one method to do this is to see, uh, again, rather than trying to locate the blowers, you know, a, a few hundred feet away from the aeration basins, can we move those blowers to uh, much closer uh, to where it's, it's actually needed uh, to avoid that pressure drop? Uh, and here we can see how dramatic uh, some of that can be as far as if we just tee into a pipe uh, versus trying to introduce it at a very uh, straight on angle. Uh, here changing from uh, 30 foot of equivalent length, uh, which in the, the previous uh, illustration of 300 feet, that's an additional 10% added of, of equivalent piping length just for the first tee. Uh, and then you still have the bends thereafter. Uh, whereas if we introduce it at a very uh, straight on angle, uh, this could be down closer to 10 foot of length or you know, a third as much. Uh, so this can be very uh, dramatic. So this might be in a, a multi uh, blower setup where you might have uh, three or more blowers. Uh, when we see two blowers, this is not an uncommon uh, arrangement to see. Uh, where you know each blower feeds in, and then it makes it makes a turn, and then heads out the uh, center header. Uh, so regardless of which blower is operating, the air has to make the 90 degree bend and make its way through the T. Uh, so either way, this is uh, roughly 45 foot uh, of equivalent length to make those two bends uh, for both blowers. Whereas if we were to just make a, a small uh, piping adjustment to this and instead have one blower be straight on and the other one uh, make more smooth curves, you know, this adds either zero equivalent length for one blower or 14 foot for the other. Uh, so here again, that's a reduction of uh, a third for the longer uh, blower uh, and an, uh, basically an infinite reduction for the others. Uh, so being aware of, of these little, uh, little slight tweaks that can make a substantial improvement. Uh, again, you know, changing 30, removing 30 feet of pressure drop uh, can be substantive. So, uh, then looking at uh, the actual air distribution. So here on the left, we see uh, this is a uh, facility with some coarse bubble diffusers uh, and uh, the center is more of a, a linear uh, fine bubble diffuser, and on the right is uh, some round uh, fine bubble diffusers. And understanding that these can be valved, so you may also consider for your facility, you know, what are some additional control points that I might add, uh, rather than necessarily having to introduce air across the entire basin at one time. Uh, this may be something where uh, being able to adjust where the aer aeration is occurring uh, from time to time can be useful. Uh, and so this could be a, an op opportunity to add some controllability uh, if your site may allow, if there is more than one, uh, more than one takeoff, being able to adjust where that air is. Uh, and again, providing an opportunity to uh, settle and disrupt uh, the, the basins uh, to help with some of the mixing rather than trying to always maintain a steady state. Again, some of this also goes back to uh, what is your diffuser placement? Uh, Sean talked about this a little bit in the last presentation uh, as far as you know, are you trying to cover the entire floor uh, with aeration and understanding that the, the diffuser placement can uh, impact the flow geometry. Uh, the most extreme example uh, on the top where I'm using a single uh, lift, uh, single lift aerator, uh, which then creates a, a single circular flow uh, through a basin and as we add more, we can add more and more uh, loops. And so by adding more diffusers, uh, that can allow us to more precisely uh, provide mixing geometry, uh, depending on piping and valves. Uh, and some of this can also be done uh, with automation. 
uh, understanding that as the, the fluid is moving down or stagnating, uh, that material can settle out, uh, which uh, can allow it to uh, be treated by different microbes, uh, but it can also build up as a sludge layer. Uh, so understanding where that, uh, where that balance is, and perhaps some of this is uh, allowing some of the uh, material to settle and then disturbing it uh, as we change treatments to get uh, nitrification, denitrification, and, and perhaps some uh, biological nutrient removal as part of that as well. So, this is a little bit of a, a newer technology coming out to the market, uh, looking at using membrane uh, distribution. Uh, these, uh, rather than trying to move the air through uh, the basin, uh, instead ends up needing to rely on mixers to move the fluid past the uh, air particles uh, rather than moving the air particles through the fluid. So uh, understanding that, that whatever air is reaching the surface and then uh, dissipating is not being able to be transferred in. Uh, and so one uh, primary feature of the, these membrane uh, distributions is because they operate at very low pressures, they can uh, operate uh, with a, a fairly small, uh, relatively small uh, motor size uh, as far as how much horsepower is required for that. Uh, so uh, these may be uh, useful into the future either for new plants uh, or they may be able to uh, as plants try to uh, rearrange and, and uh, improve their treatment, uh, these modules may uh, end up being used to uh, help uh, get further treatment from a, a particular plant footprint. So uh, with that, uh, let me get another poll up here. Uh, oh, oh, guess not. Okay, not a problem. So we do have a, a few takeaways uh, before we, we do switch over to questions and answers. Uh, first of which is the importance of making sure that we're delivering enough oxygen without providing excess oxygen. Uh, again, that transfer, there is a, a point of diminishing, not only diminishing returns, but the transfer efficiency can actually decrease if we're over aerating. And understanding our, our system size and variability. And so uh, with these, you know, for fair, uh, fairly stable facilities, uh, the uh, turndown of equipment may be uh, less critical. Uh, but if you have more variable systems, uh, that then uh, making sure that you're, you're your system has the ability to uh, vary to meet that changing demand and load flexibility. And selecting equipment based on the efficiency over your current and expected uh, range, not just the, the range perhaps in you know, 30 years from now, uh, but here looking at over the, the course of the next uh, several years, uh, where's that expected range? As Hannah mentioned, we've seen uh, several sites where uh, they have seen uh, shifts in their uh, loading, which changes. Uh, sometimes they they have a decrease of loading uh, despite an increase in population uh, through other efficiencies and, and better treatment at uh, sites that may have high loading capabilities. Uh, and so, uh, again, designing for what is your uh, typical and expected range and not just selecting uh, based on your peak range and designing for that load flexibility. Uh, this, uh, this site here uh, had, uh, you know, has four blowers. And so with each of these, as their load increases or decreases, uh, they can bring on or, or take offline some various, uh, some of their blowers. And so having that, that, uh, substantial flexibility to add air as needed and take it offline as it's not uh, can be very useful. So uh, 
As noted, this is a second in a series. Uh, there is a, a companion series for lagoons. Uh, there will be a, a similar uh, session on oxygen transfer for lagoons here in two weeks on November 30th. And the third in our uh, activated sludge series is on January 11th uh, regarding control strategies uh, for aeration equipment. So uh, with that, let's check in with Cassie here regarding any questions that we may have. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ryan and Hannah, for an awesome presentation today. Um, and thanks for everybody's fun comments in the chat, responding to questions, asking questions. Um, great webinar. Uh, I, we do have a couple of questions here today. Um, so the first question is, uh, what would indicate that my diffusers are fouling? And Hannah, please feel free to chime in. Orion, do you have any suggestions or thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, one, one method on that is looking at, because uh, as they foul, that's going to increase the, the system pressures. And so that could be something to uh, be watching for is uh, system pressures and, and system flow. As you see, uh, pressures rising versus your flow, uh, that will be indicating that, that you are uh, seeing some fouling and may also provide you some indications as far as when the time is to uh, perhaps clean. As you see the, uh, you know, you, you may have had your, uh, your system able to turn back a, a little further and saying, I, I need that range. Great, great. Well, thank you for addressing that. And one question that popped up in the chat was, does anybody or do you know of effective methods for detecting underground air leaks? Uh, detecting underground air leaks uh, are, are fairly difficult to do. Um, I, I'm not sure. I know there is uh, technology out there for uh, detecting leaks in water piping systems uh, through ultrasonic means. Uh, there may be similar uh, means and methods to do that for air, since air is a fluid. Uh, however, it, it may be a little bit uh, more difficult. Uh, but that may be a, a place to start is to reach out to a, a water leak detection uh, system, particularly focusing on uh, ultrasonic. They may be able to assist with that. That's a great idea. I know we've um, we've we've seen some plants that we've worked with that uh, we've we've kind of looked at those different opportunities too. <laughs> well, great. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or Ryan or Hannah, do you have anything else to add in today's session? I think that covers the majority of our questions today that we've gotten. All right, well, then hearing no other questions, uh, we're going to, it looks like we're gonna wrap up early. Um, so thank you all for joining today's session. Thank you to Ryan and Hannah um, for presenting today. Uh, again, we will send out the recording and the slides um, as soon as they're available. Um, also, again, thank you for everybody noting that you are interested in CEUs. Um, I will get you those CEU numbers and certificates out as soon as I possibly can. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, please let um, myself or our team know and we're happy to help you get started on an energy assessment to explore these different opportunities and also funding for these opportunities. So we look forward to hearing from you. Look forward to continue working with you. Again, we have our session coming up, as Ryan said, for Lagoon Systems on November 30th. And the third part of this aeration and energy series um, will resume in January, on January 11th for activated sludge plants. I'll send you that link in the email too when I follow up so that you can register for that session as well. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye.